picture a painting of a woman smiling. Picture a famous painting of a woman smiling. Got it? Was it this? <laughs> Did I get it right? What comes to mind when you see the Mona Lisa, the Gioconda? Is it the mystery of who she was? Or the story of the famous painter that made her? Or is it the smile? Everybody knows that Mona Lisa's famous smile, the mystery of this famous smile, is probably one of the most famous, talked about smiles in all the world, across civilizations around the world. But it always bothered me as a dentist that in the world's most famous smile, you never got to see her teeth. <laughs> I've been practicing for almost 20 years now, and before we get into how dentistry, I think, is more valuable than you might think, I'd also like you just to share with me this story. Imagine you are a young, active member of society. You've got a date planned for tonight, a business interview next week. You're preparing what to wear. You have friends waiting you for dinner. You've got dreams and hopes, ambitions. No matter where you're from, everybody can imagine this point in their lives. And the last thing on your mind is tripping down the stairs and losing your two central incisors. <laughs> and this beautiful young girl, before this very moment, never ever thought about the dentist seriously before. So not many people in the world actually give us our due credit until we're actually needed. <laughs> and there are many, many ways to recover this, and this is one of my specialities, and it's a beautiful thing to actually help somebody get back to where they need to be, to give back one of the most powerful social tools that we have. I did some TV shows a few years ago, and makeover shows and it was an incredible experience to actually measure scientifically how people's emotions were affected uh, by cosmetic interventions. Everybody's heard of plastic surgery and hair transplants and a facelift and Botox and Restylane and all of these, these are commercial brands but what I'm trying to say is um, all these medical treatments that help people feel better with their self-esteem, with the way that they want to be projected in the world because at the end of the day, our face, our smile is a huge weapon in our social interaction. Not just the way we communicate, but the way we present ourselves. Can you imagine showing up for a job interview with this? I really probably wouldn't go that well. And we, we found out was that when people recover their smile through advanced dentistry, they actually brought 23% 23 more, 23 more happiness, more self-esteem, better self-confidence than any other cosmetic intervention. But dentistry hasn't always been this amazing thing that we get to do today. I don't know if you know this, but dentistry actually evolved from the barbers. The p yanking a tooth was one of the most common treatments. It was relatively easy. Get some pliers and pull them out, and this was being done back in the Middle Ages. Dentistry goes back to the Aztecs, the Incas. The, the, uh, the Romans did dentistry, had gold bindings. It was incredible. And more recently, with the advent of anesthetics, basically if you paid an extra five cents, you could have anesthetics when you had your tooth pulled out. So there's no mystery to why so many people actually hate going to the dentist, because for so many years it was a horrible experience. And at the same time, just like when you go to all these beautiful modern or beautiful uh, museums around the world, you don't see smiles in any of the art. Picture all the Renaissance art in all these beautiful museums around the world, you don't see smiles. It w wasn't something that was perceived as important. And this, again, is something that has always puzzled me. So I, I started thinking about this a little bit more, and I think that it has to do with also photography. Because when did we start actually seeing smiles more often? Because the advent of photography, the early photographs, people were very like, serious, you know, because take about 20, 30 minutes to actually process that photograph. So with the advent of black and white photography in the late 20s, early 30s, we started seeing other people's smiles more often. And if you start seeing those early photographs, you'll start noticing that people had a lot of teeth missing. Now, dentistry has evolved a lot, and there are many, many sciences and technologies out there to help people get their smiles back. And I can safely say that a trip to the dentist today really is pain-free. 
But let's talk a little bit about dental history. This is the denture of George Washington. Now everybody can picture George Washington, the founder of the United States of America. He had this in his mouth when he signed the Declaration of Independence. This is actually carved out of wood. It's horse teeth binded with gold wiring. And he actually had to put this in a glass at night. Port wine, actually. So that's why a little Portuguese uh, <laughs> uh, came to fame there, to help soften the, the discomfort in his mouth. Because when you think about it, how important is our mouth to us? It's something that it's, we start our digestion with, where we chew. It helps talk. Can you imagine talking without your front teeth? It's pretty difficult. It helps support our articulation and can lead to chronic headaches and back pains when, the, when, our, when our TMJ is not in position. But most importantly, it's this incredible social tool. I wonder how different the world would be if George Washington had a nice set of teeth. Now, in our defense, dentistry and dentists all around the world, we have a really hard job. Not many people know that us dentists actually are licensed to practice over 2,000 independent procedures, from a simple polishing to bleaching to orthodontics to surgeries to complex bone reconstruction, plastic gum surgery. You'd be surprised the array of different procedures we can do. And the quantity of companies out there saying this product's better than that product and this technology is better than that technology. And again, here we are alone with our patient, having to give them back their smile and having to make all these difficult decisions in a very difficult environment. And again, nobody likes going to the dentist. <laughs> we have a tough time and we really, really apply as much as we can to help you get back your smile. And Something that might appear scary, but the truth is, is that there's no police in dentistry. You get a license to practice, to, get, you know, to hold a, a gun, to carry a, a gun, to drive a car, and if you have an accident and you're to blame, then there's consequences to pay. But in dentistry, there's actually pretty much no policing. It's uh, the limits of what can be done are pretty much the doctor's experience and his own personal ethics. And analog dentistry, old school dentistry, uh, is shifting now in the last 10 years to a digital uh, format and that's something that I want to get into a bit later but the time where all the decision-making process had to be done by one human being with his patient limited by the technology he had in his small practice or in his large practice those days are changing and this is something very good because I think the quality of dentistry around the world is getting better and better and you'd be surprised that even Facebook has improved the way that dentists practice because dentists now are photographing their work and they're posting this online, sharing cases, and all of a sudden somebody's like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. So you'd be surprised that something as simple as Facebook has actually changed the way that us dentists treat you guys. And this is wonderful. Now, another uh, side of dentistry is the way that the business model is run. There are more and more franchise clinics around the world. There's more and more corporations running these practices. And again, everybody knows that famous joke, well, you're not a doctor, you're just a dentist. <laughs> but at the same time, we don't get the luxury of having our practices inside a hospital. We actually have to build our own mini hospitals by ourselves with our own investments. So dentistry is an expensive profession because we have to literally build everything from scratch so that you can get the best technology, the best treatment uh, that money can buy. And there are free hugs, but I don't think there's free dental care. So you really need to be careful when finding very cheap solutions for something that is so precious as your smile. Now, in my lifetime, I grew up with this phone. And I remember dialing a long distance phone call. It used to take ages to make a, an intercontinental phone call. And sometimes you'd make a mistake halfway through. Like, oh, You'd have to go back and, and the shift from this phone to the first cell phone, and I'm sure everybody can recognize the cell phone. This was such a huge paradigm shift. You could all of a sudden make a phone call outside, uh, on the bus, on your way home. This was a huge shift in the way that society connected with each other. And again, this, the, this evolution accompanied medicine as well. And the jump from the first cell phone to this phone where all of a sudden now, hey, I can do my emails. I'm even more connected and the jump to the smartphone, the ubiquitous smartphone was huge. This was a huge revolution. 
a paradigm shift in the way society thinks of each other. And you'd be surprised how this tool has reshaped the trip to the dentist. And this metaphor of how phones have evolved just in the last 15 years has been accompanying medicine, not just mainstream medicine, but dentistry as well. So today, we don't think twice when we see on the news or we see documentaries about bionic arms, about chips placed inside a patient's brain that help them hear or gain taste, how war veterans that come back from war zones have their prosthetic limbs put back on and after a few months of rehabilitation are running and sprinting and becoming active members of society again. And this evolution has actually been accompanying us dentists as well always on the fringe of mainstream medicine. The fact that we were the poorer relative of, of doctors, our self-esteem, I guess, pushed us to want to go further. The fact that for so many decades, a trip to the dentist was such a nasty experience. Collectively, around the world, companies and dentists and scientists have got together to develop really amazing technologies to soften the experience, to mitigate responsibility, to help using the cloud to help colleagues from Africa connect with dentists in Chicago and South Korea and teams are coming together. So connection and connectivity is really changing the way that we actually practice. So today you can go to the dentist and you remember that girl at the beginning, you can go to the dentist, you can have a CT scan done which actually sees the three dimensional profile of your bone, your jaw, then you can have intraoral scanners that actually scan your mouth. This information can go into the cloud and if you aren't experienced, if you don't know what to do, and remember, the old school dentists pretty much had to make all these decisions by themselves and nobody does everything well. So now with this kind of information, we can upload this on our smartphone, on the cloud and say, hey, can you help me? And the fact that social media is now something that we take for granted Imagine what this is doing within dentistry, within medicine. The fact that now a 23-year-old junior dentist can connect with somebody with a bit more time and a bit more experience anywhere in the world and say, could you help me? And that, ba that boundary, that obstacle, is something that is really changing the way people are treating and the way patients are also perceiving a trip to a dentist. 3D printing milling units have speeded up the, the, the process between taking an impression and having a crown placed in your mouth and the results are astounding. Robotics are arriving and again I think that in the future this will actually help third world countries and as you can see on the right side here unfortunately probably 90 percent if not more of the world's population do not have access to first world dentistry. They're still pretty much in the time of uh, mid last century uh, where sometimes even anesthetic aren't available and nobody really thinks about this because just like the Mona Lisa effect nobody really cares until it really matters. So the next time you go to a dentist uh, ask them about te technologies inspire them to th rethink the way that things are going and you might be surprised and next time you have an accident or a problem don't be scared to go to the dentist and in the future, who knows, that art might change <laughs> and we might start giving a little bit more value to one of the most important things we have, our smile. Thank you.